I, I want the history of this car. History? I don't really know. You don't have to be in the shot if you don't want, but your voice needs to be. <laughs> yeah. the microphone's over there. Is that rolling? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um. Wait, intro. <laughs> over here. I don't Stanner. know anything about this car. That's what I know. No. Um, Wait. What? I got to intro the car, and then you're standing here. You Just stand here next to me. Let me talk for a second. Okay. Hey guys, Scanner Danner here with my brother at his shop at Danner's Automotive, right? Danner's, Danner's Automotive. I just need to put an S right there until I get this. So it's not part. Danner Automotive, it's Danner's, Danner's Automotive. Yeah. All right, sweet. Apostrophe S. Okay. Which means there's one Danner, even though there's two Danners. <laughs> well, it ain't my shop, it's his. <laughs> um, anyway, working on a 2006 Suzuki something or other and it has a really maybe. bad misfire and i just wanted to bring danner in to give us a quick history what's the car yeah, so she said it was kind of scattered it's been to a bunch of shops there was valve cover leak issues there was exhaust leak issues and when she first talked it sounded like right after she got the exhaust fixed the thing had no power okay and i'm thinking maybe it had a clogged secondary converter of course my phone's gonna ring is that gonna come in on there yep yep all right so, vehicle history okay i don't know much about it but it was a couple different shops and it finally ended up at five star that i do a lot of their work and they said i ah, just go see danner so um what i know about it is it it had a valve cover leak that someone didn't do right and that turned into fiasco and then it had some exhaust leaks and for inspection it seemed like she said after she got the exhaust fixed it started running bad <clears throat> and i was thinking first thought maybe a secondary converter was mm -hmm. clogged and they fixed a flex pipe right. and then you have no power now. right i've seen that blow egr valves out and stuff like that on fords but so i thought that at first but then i went to go drive and it is falling on its face you know what i mean but she did say even for a while before that it was really hard to start cold and then when it did run it would finally start and she's only driving a couple miles so it, you know yeah and then her husband put a fuel pump in i think if you look back there the seat's still out of it okay because the fuel pumps in the floor through the ac access panel because they smelled fuel probably because it's misfiring so bad yeah so and fuel pumps been replaced yeah. valve cover yeah. exhaust work was done yeah. and, and now it she can't even climb a hill with it okay so she's been walking back and forth to work taking a trolley okay and she was okay with it but she's getting a new job in two weeks so i have like a week and a half okay. now to get this thing running so yeah. she can do what she needs to do okay and that's all i really know like like i said my first thought was maybe the exhaust is clogged but if you drive it it's yeah. firing so bad yeah i got you that and i want to say something too about uh what we're doing here at my brother's shop he can do this stuff uh, this is actually a win-win situation. He's here by himself. He's still looking for a tech, by the way. But um, this allows him to do whatever else he needs to do, and it feeds me work for you guys. So just so we're clear, this isn't like Danner needs me on this I don't job. Care. I like. I'll say I need him. No, he doesn't. It's fine. He doesn't. Coming. He doesn't need me. My Go wife. answer your phone for your wife. My wife's calling. We're gonna get started on this car. All right. So while Caleb was grabbing the tripod, which we forgot he had to drive home, I did a real quick code scan on this and a couple of quick tests and I'll bring you guys up to speed. Uh, here's the codes that are in memory for the car. We have a random misfire P0300 and then cylinder one and cylinder four misfires. Um, I did a full code scan, so I didn't look at these other ones. Let me just briefly view these. Airbag I don't care about right now. Speed sensitive power steering I am not concerned about right now. All right, so we're just dealing with some engine codes. Um, I don't care what Shore Track says at the top as far as commonly replaced parts. Um, means nothing to me right now. Uh, it is nice to have that kind of information, but that kind of information can definitely sway you in a diagnostic process. So we're going to handle this just at face value on what it's doing and, and direction. And let me let you guys hear the way it runs. Um, unfortunately, I did start this off camera and it wouldn't start. I had to keep my foot on the gas pedal to make the thing run. Kind of matches what my brother said about a cold starting problem. Like I literally had to hold my foot on the pedal to keep it running. And, and once I did that, it does run, but I'll let you listen to it. I might have to get inside of it, put my foot on the pedal.
Yeah, I mean, it, it's a lot better than what it was when I started. It's actually, wow. There's the miss. Okay, well, I, I really wish I would have captured this. This kind of answers more questions for me though in, in the fact that it's running pretty smoothly right now. When I first started it, it was a severe misfire, severe, and I had to keep my foot on the gas pedal. I, I'm gonna rev it a couple times just to listen to it. Yeah, on, on the rev up, we still have a d -d 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 -d, like a miss. Hear it? Yeah. Let's see if we can get the camera mic on that. Okay, something else to note when I when I started this off camera, and I'm mad that I did. I should never do that, Caleb. It was foolish of me, but I was waiting on you. Um, my check engine light was flashing when we first started, and it had a dead misfire. It wasn't just one cylinder either. It was multiple cylinders you could feel. It was hardly running. And now it's at least idling okay, but when you rev it, it it's definitely missing every time I rev it. Um, so with it, with a hard misfire, uh, I did a cylinder drop test under the hood because I wanted to know what cylinders, and we had one in four, and this being a waste spark ignition system, one and four are on the same coil pack, so right away I'm worried about the coil pack, just based on the codes. And with it misfiring really, really heavy, I wanted to see what my spark was on one and four compared to two and three. Uh, that, that's really what I'm thinking about. So let's go under the hood and do that. The unfortunate part about where we are is some of you might be thinking, well, why am I choosing this test? Well, I'm choosing this test because of what it did before, not because of what it's doing now. I think with the car running and hitting on all four cylinders, I don't know that I would necessarily grab my test light and do my spark test that you guys have seen me do a thousand times. But the way it was running off camera, and I missed this, I apologize. It was a dead misfire on multiple cylinders. I wanted to know what my spark gap, the distance it jumped because it's one and four and they're on the same coil pack. And so we have two coils, it's one assembly. We have cylinders two and three and one and four. I'm, uh, I'm not sure which, which is which at the moment, but that's our cylinder layout, okay? Waste spark ignition. I have my test light going to ground. I don't generally like to go to the battery for this test because if I have an air gap issue, not that you would with a direct alligator clip connection to battery negative, but if there was an air gap issue with my connection, then I'm gonna send that spark, the arc of the spark near the battery, and we don't want that. I've had a battery blow up on me once with a spark plug. I don't know if I had it on film, but I was doing a relative compression test or doing a cylinder compression, and I pulled the spark plug wire off and I laid it on top of the battery, and I forgot to disable the ignition system. And when I cranked it over, I actually had Pete, my friend Pete crank it over, the battery blew up. And what saved me from all the battery acid was the label on the battery actually stayed attached on the one side and it blew the other side and it shot all on the hood. And so it was bad, it was loud, my ears were ringing for like a day. So it's a real concern. Batteries can explode, it's a real concern. Not so much for this test, but just in my memory, it's why I stay away from connecting my test light to the battery for a spark test. Now I've had this question asked to me in the past as well, which is how do you know your ground is good? You guys hear me say that a lot. Connect your light, check your ground. We can do that. In fact, that's probably a bad ground. So notice it's not even lighting my test light. But the thing about that is it's connected to metal and the, the spark test I'm doing, it's gonna go that way anyway, even though it's not a, a ground that's good enough to light my light. Now I can wiggle it and make it a good ground, but I've had that question in the past. Hey, Danner, when you do your spark test, why didn't you check your ground on your test light? You always do with everything else. And the point is, you can have some resistance on the end of your connection, and it's no problem for the spark to go there because we're talking 60,000 volts, not 12 volts, okay? That's why I don't check it when I do this test. Just put it on something metal, all right? We'll be good. All right, so here's the test. Again, I did this when the car was misfiring, and uh, this spark's a little scary. Watch out, what, what do you see how far this thing jumps? Like, that is, that is one hell of an arc. I mean, that's, holy crap. That is a huge, all right, huge. All right. That looks insane. 
And so, just so we're clear, the electrodes in, way inside of here too. And I mean, that, that's like a two, that's like a two inch gap. All right, same coil. So this is two, uh, two and two. So essentially this is the same coil, the opposite firing cylinder, the opposite polarity. And that one is not jumping as far because of dirt and it's jumping on the outside of the coil, but man, is that a strong spark, okay? Yeah. Now watch this one. Doesn't even leave the tower. If you get the camera down in, I here. can see it like, like a little bit. So, I mean, a lot of people would look at that and say, oh, that, that's a good spark. I mean, it is decent, right? But it's super weak in comparison, isn't it? It doesn't even jump out of the tower, all right? So that's that one. And you hear the RPM change, so it is contributing. Same thing, weak spark, okay? This is cylinders one and four. When I did this originally, same thing, weak spark, but no RPM changes because those cylinders were not firing because the spark plugs are wet. Weak spark equals fuel fouled spark plugs. Customers complaining of cold engine starting problems. I believe the customer's cold starting problem is related to what we saw and that's from weak spark and uh, weak spark equals fuel fouled spark plugs. So Caleb, fuel's being sprayed into the cylinders. We're still compressing it, but with a weak spark at times, it's not gonna jump the gap. Mm -hmm. Okay, the spark plug under compression, remember under compression, it's harder for the spark to jump the gap. And so that plug's not gonna fire and the injectors are still spraying. What do you have? Fuel fouled spark plugs. And now we have a really, really severe misfire all the time. That's what we had when I first started this car and we missed it. This needs a coil pack. We have control, we have spark, needs a coil pack, definitely. Now we can do some follow up checks just to be sure, which is the current flow to this circuit, but it's a shared power feed. We should make sure that they both have the same dwell time, the same saturation time. Honestly, if I'm not filming and teaching, we're done. I'm putting a coil pack in this. Now there's a few other things we wanna worry about before putting parts in this is one, does the car have maybe some type of a mechanical problem too? Compression, so we would wanna verify compression. The other thing too, I don't even think I would mess around. This would get plugs and wires as well. So spark plugs, wires, coil pack, done. By a simple code scan, test light, some knowledge, variable spark gaps. Let's look at that one more time just to get a comparison between the two as far as the gap goes. Okay, watch. All right, there's the top of your tower. My test light's laying on the top of the plastic. Right now we have about a half inch gap going on. Watch how far that jumps. Crazy. Right? Is, I would not want to get bit by this coil. That thing is really, really strong. It won't even reach up and grab my test light. I have to put my test light down inside. Okay? Definitely weak spark. Now one of the things you could do if you had a coil like this with no spark from the one side, so no spark from this side, good spark from this one, you could stay with your test light. Dude, I got lucky. Did you see my, my test light? And we probably caught it on the GoPro. When I did that last test, Caleb, my end of my test light was just laying right here. So look, it's just sitting there. This proves my point about not needing a good ground for when you do this test. Yeah. At least it chose that path and not me. That would be the dangers. And there's really no danger here. It's not like it's gonna kill me. Um, it's just wouldn't feel too good. All right, so I, I am switching to battery negative now for this test. I just wanna show you guys a quick control test staying with the test light. I was just gonna say that I take grills apart sometimes for the little shock things and I was looking for one for about five minutes so I could come hit him while he was doing <laughs> that, but I couldn't find it. Uh, that would have been good. Let's get a shot of these three wires right here, Kayla. Just judging by what I'm seeing, I'm, I'm betting the center wire is my power feed and then my two outer wires are the control wires. And so all I'm gonna do is really just back probe all three of those and show you what the test light would look like. We should see a, a flicker in the test light. All right, I'm just gonna 
back row of this. There's my, my center wire. Steady light. This would be the good coil. See the flicker? And then over here. See the flicker? Yep. Actually made it miss with my test light in there. And the reason behind that is I'm, I'm stealing some of the current to light my test light and that spark is weak to begin with. But that's what you'd be looking for doing a test like this. If you had no spark on that back coil, does the test light flicker? Do you have control? For those of you that want more information on what I'm talking about, control testing, I want to refer you to chapter 22 in my book and in my in my lectures where we talk about control testing with a test light as it relates to ignition coils. Um, also another one would be the Corvette we just did here, Caleb. We did control testing with the light, if you remember, for the faulty ignition module where we had no flicker, and then we did when we were finished. That would be a good one to refer you guys to as well, the Corvette video. Um, uh, the last part of this, honestly, I'll show you um, some lab scope stuff just because I'm teaching, and um, some of you would have some questions. Well, what about the control or the dwell for that coil? And I agree with you, I have some case studies dealing with a module failure where the dwell time is off and that's why the spark is weak and it's not really a bad coil. So we're really addressing that one extreme variable, I'll call it, where you can have a um, ignition module or driver that's not grounding the coil properly and it's giving you weak spark, making you think you have a bad coil. So we're gonna do that last check. So we do an amperage measurement on an ignition coil. In this case, I want to go to the feed wire that goes to both of them because I want to see them both at the same time. But you have to remember with amp clamps that you have this amp probe next to the coil itself. You're going to get some noise from that. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, things to consider. We want to make sure that we're only around the one wire and that we want to keep this amp clamp away from this part of the coil as much as possible. I may have to split that tape and move it down further if I get a lot of noise from this. Uh, the lab scope connections are just yellow and black. Even though I'm, it's a red lead, my students, my new guys, and I have them in class, they always want to put the red to the red. You can do that, but I want to use channel one as my default. And the amp clamp is red only because it's universal. That's a standard color. So red to red's not what I want to do. Just going to my scope multimeter. I'm going to set this up manually. Lab scope. Oh, I picked volts DC. That doesn't matter. I can change that within here. Hit the probe. We'll go low amp 20. My pattern's upside down, as you can see. Right? That's a good lesson on why we never want our zero line at the bottom. Caleb, you know this from editing some of my videos. You can think there's no signal. Yep. So we're going to invert that. Here, let's trigger that. This, this is actually both coils that are firing at the same time on the screen. You see that big tail there? And that pattern just changed on me too. I know I'm on the feed wire, so we're looking at both coils here. So what the big tail suggests is an open in the, in the secondary, like one of these plug wires is open. When you see that big tail at the end, this is a shorted secondary winding. Yeah. When you see the curvature, and we'll, we'll watch that change too. But yeah, I saw it just, The right? characteristic was changing yeah. on that. Uh, this is just um, a classic example of why we do plug wires and plugs when you have a coil failure like this. There, now it's straight again. Look at it. Yeah. And the tail changed. What is the tail? Like so the tail end of the current ramp would be when the field collapses. And that's where spark occurs. Yeah. Spark occurs right where that area is. And when you have an open plug wire, we've collapsed all that energy. We try to surge it out. It has nowhere to go. And so the energy builds up really, really high in the coil and gives you a really big coil firing event. And that causes a tail on the ramp. So that's what we're looking at. I, I don't know that we have an open plug wire that's causing that, 
Yeah, and the tail's kind of changing as well. This is a shorted coil. My main purpose here was to look at the length of time, the dwell time between the coil events. And again, because I'm on the feed wire, to be clear, when we put our test light down here, I don't even need to check a diagram. It was steady on the middle wire, it flickered on the right wire, and it flickered on the left wire. So which one's my feed wire? The one I'm on. You understand lab scopes, you understand that what we're looking at is both coils that are being drawn on the same part of the screen over and over and over again. And my point is, my dwell time, if you look at it, let me throw a cursor in here so we're all on the same page. My cursor, my dwell time, notice that it's consistent both coils are being controlled. So the uh, question to you, Caleb, is if both coils are being controlled for the same amount of time, and really we have the same amperage, how's the driver and wiring module? How's the module? That's really what we're doing. Module's good. That's what this tells us, okay? So the variable of a faulty module, not a concern. You see that shifting a little bit while the pattern's changing? That's just because my trigger point level is changing when that coil shows me the arc. Nothing wrong with this at all as far as the module and control goes. Faulty coil. Danner, don't mess around with this man. Definitely do plugs and wires as well. Okay? Plugs, wires, ignition coil. Um, oh, I mentioned compression. Um, we may come back to this. As far as compression goes, this is real easy. Just going to shut the car off. Hold my foot on the gas pedal, it's a clear flood crank, listen to it. Okay, nice, consistent, uniform cranking sound. This does not have uh, at least good enough to sell the job, this does not have a compression problem. So right away, you pull codes, you find a single cylinder misfire, put the pedal to the floor, the crank it over, cut the injection pulse. Not all cars have a clear flood, so you got to come under the hood and pull a fuel pump relay out or pull the injector fuse off or an ignition coil fuse. Make the car not start. Listen to it. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Pretty sweet, that sound, right? Awesome. One more time through the edits. Here's what it sounds like. Good compression. Here's what it sounds like with a single cylinder with no compression. Um, I just searched high and low for secondary ignition adapters that I can hook up for my Varus and I don't have them with me so I can't show you that unless I switch to my laptop and grab my Pico scope and I'm debating on whether or not to do that. I don't know that I'm going to. Um, I just want to do one more thing. And that is to show you just a little bit longer time base so we can get both of these on the screen. In fact, let's do this. Okay. So I think I was misinterpreting what I was looking at before. I was thinking that was both coils being drawn there, but I'm missing that trigger point at times and it's only drawing the bad one. So, in other words, that's not both coils right there. That's only the one because of the trigger. Now, if I pause that and zoom out, we should have every other one. Every other one's going to show us that, that ramp. You can see the curved line. Uh, the curved and the one and then so, the ones. This one, that's curved. Shorted secondary. Classic view of a shorted secondary with that ramp looking like that yeah you explain and then that. the next one over is going to be so that's that one again see it's curved right there uh -huh. see how it's straight right there yeah okay okay so let's let's move down this way now curved yeah. see it next one straight curved straight curved straight curved now when i had it live the reason that looks like, it's, I said, when you trigger a scope, it's drawn in the same place over and over, mm -hmm. that trigger level's different. If I 
if I move this trigger level, you're gonna see it should draw that straight one too. Because both of them have the ramp in that location. Let's try a negative uh, opposite slope. See it on this one. See? It? Oh yeah. So it's bouncing. It's, now it's only picking up the good one. Let's change that to a positive. It should be switching back and forth. In fact, that's doing that now because I'm on a rising edge and we have some a, a lot of tails, a lot of hash over here in this area. Um, but I, I apologize that I actually misinterpreted that just based on my trigger, that it, it is absolutely every other one. And the, the funny thing is, is our good ramp, the one that has the straight ramp to begin with, has the real high tail, meaning we have an open, even on our good coil, we have, uh, what that's suggesting is a, a, an open plug wire or a very high resistance uh, plug wire. And that's probably what killed the coil in the first place. I wanted to show you guys the high KV but I don't have the adapters to show you that. This is good enough. We're getting plugs, wires, coil pack. Um, I could show a, a couple of resistance measurements on the plug wires, but I don't think that's important either. Should I, would it be worth it, Caleb, for me to break out the laptop and show the secondary KVs? Other than that, I do an ohm check on the... Well, it's a, a probe that I put over that I can measure the voltage of each plug wire, which would tell me whether or not I have an open plug wire. I mean, it's it's not open, open, because it's not misfiring at idle, right? Oh, no, it's bad. It, it, if you rev it, you know, that's the symptom of weak spark. And Caleb and the rest of you can listen yeah, in on this. Even under load, if you put it in gear, yeah. sitting there. Just sign, sitting, in, yep, sitting there dead revving it. Why does it miss? When we, when we increase cylinder pressures is the answer. Um, you step on the throttle, you're packing more air in, fuel of course too, and then when you compress it, it's harder for that spark to jump the gap. And we have weak spark and so it misfires. And I believe that's our cold starting too. I think the plugs were fouled out and... I have a four plug it. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, it, they were when we started. Like it was a dead miss when I first started yeah. it. Looking at these tails again, Caleb, I'm not, I don't think it's worth it for us to hook up another lab scope to show you guys secondary. It's getting the plug wires anyway. Here's the warning for all of you. If you have a coil that fails like we did, you want to make sure that you're doing the rest of the secondary as well. If it's a coil unplug, change the spark plug. If it's a coil assembly like this one, change the plug wires. And if you're not going to change the plug wires, you better at least do a resistance measurement on them to make sure you don't have any open ones. Talk to your customer too. Sometimes they'll bring you the car with new plugs and wires already on it. So that's a factor as well. But this is pretty straightforward. Not much to it. Uh, faulty ignition coil. We're doing plugs and wires too. And uh, you know, there's really nothing else to show you guys. I don't see a reason to wait and come back and show you an after result. You kind of have a good view right now of what a good waveform looks like and what a bad waveform looks like. So I just don't, don't see the follow-up being necessary on this one. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. Caleb, thanks for being with me. Danner, thanks for letting me use your shop. Yes, sir. See you guys next time.